isn't there something beautiful about about making the world a better place for people that you love your friends your family or yourself you know and the, when you think about the the entire arc of human existence and you roll the clock back 500,000 years and you think about every struggle of everyone that came before us and everything they had to overcome in order to put you here right now you know you, you kind of you got to admire that right you got to respect that to engineer is divine you can make lots of arguments as why we're here we're here to we're either here to entertain ourselves or we're here to uh, to create something that's beautiful or something that's functional i think if you're an engineer you entertain yourself by creating something that's both beautiful and functional focus your energy guard your time train your mind train your body think for yourself curate your friends curate your environment keep your promises stay cheerful and constructive and upgrade the world i think it'll go forever right i mean I think the Bitcoin is is going to it's going to climb in a serpentine fashion. It's going to advance and come back, and it's going to keep uh, it's going to keep climbing. I think that the volatility attracts all the capital into the marketplace, and so the volatility makes it the most interesting thing in the financial universe. It also generates massive yield and massive returns for traders, and that attracts capital. Like we're talking about the difference between 5% return and 500% return. Mm -hmm. So the fast money is attracted by the volatility. The volatility has been decreasing year by year by year. I think that um, that uh, it's stabilizing. I don't think we'll see as much volatility in the future as we have in the past. I think that um, if we look at Bitcoin and model it as uh, digital gold you know the market cap goes to between 10 and 20 trillion but gold is remember gold is is defective property gold is dead money you have a billion dollars of gold that sits in a vault for a decade it's very hard to mortgage the gold it's also very hard to rent the gold you can't loan the gold no one's going to create a business with your gold so gold doesn't generate much of a yield. So for that reason, most people wouldn't store a billion dollars for a decade in gold. They would buy a billion dollars of commercial real estate property. And the reason why is because I can rent it and generate a yield on it that's in excess of the maintenance cost. So if you consider digital property, that's a hundred to two hundred trillion dollar uh, addressable market. So I would think it, you know, it goes from 10 trillion to 100 trillion as people start to think of it as digital property. Property is low frequency money. So if you if I give you a million dollars and you want to hold it for a decade, you might go buy a house with it. Right? And uh, the house is low frequency money. You converted the the million dollars of economic energy into a structure called a house. Maybe in, after a decade, you might convert it back into energy. You might sell the house for currency. So if, uh, if I transfer $10 from me to you for a drink, and then you turn around and you buy another, right? We're vibrating on a frequency of every few hours, right? The, the energy is changing hands. But it's not likely that you sell and buy houses every few hours, right? The, the frequency of, um, of, a, of a transaction in real estate is every 10 years, every five years. It's a much lower frequency transaction. And um, so when you think about uh, what's going on here, you have extremely low frequency things, which we'll call property. Then you have mid-frequency 
things, I'm going to call them money or currency. And then you have high frequency, and that's energy. And that's why I use the illustration of you got the building, you got the light, and you got the sound, and they're all just energy moving at different frequencies. Now, Bitcoin is magical, and it's, it is truly the innovation. It's like a singularity because it represents the first time in the history of the human race that we managed to create a digital property properly understood. It's, it's easy to create something digital, right? Every coupon and every scan on Fortnite and Roblox and, and Apple TV credits and all these things, they're all digital something, but they're securities, right? Shares of stock are securities. Whenever anybody transfers, when you transfer money on PayPal or Apple Pay, you're transferring in essence a security or an IOU. And so transferring a bearer instrument with final settlement in, in the internet domain or in cyberspace, that's a critical thing. And, and anybody in the crypto world can do that. All the cryptos can do that. But what they can't do, what 99% of them fail to do is be property, their securities. Yeah, I think it keeps going up forever. I mean, is there a reason we couldn't go to 10 million coin, right? Because digital property isn't the highest form, right? Gold was that low frequency money. Property is a mid frequency money. But when I start to, when I start to um, program it faster, it starts to look like digital energy. And, and uh, then it doesn't just replace property. Then you're starting to replace bonds it's 100 trillion in bonds, there's 50 to 100 trillion in other currency derivatives. And then, the, and then, and these are all conventional use cases, right? I, I think that there's 350 trillion to 500 trillion dollars worth of currency, currency derivatives in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, that, and when I say that, I mean things that are valued based upon fiat cash flows any commercial real estate, any bond, any sovereign debt, any, any currency itself, any derivatives to those things, they're all derivatives and they're all defective. And they're all defective because of this persistent seven to 14 percent lapse, inflate, which we call inflation or monetary expansion. I believe that Bitcoin is a massive breakthrough for the human race that will cure half the problems in the world and generate hundreds of trillions of dollars of economic value to the civilization. And I believe that um, it's in an early stage where many people don't understand it and they're afraid of it and there's FUD and there's uncertainty, there's doubt, and there's fear. And there's a very noisy crypto world and there's 15,000 other cryptos that are are seeking relevance. And I think most of the FUD uh, is actually fueled by the other crypto entrepreneurs. So the environmental FUD and the other types of, of uncertainty that's around Bitcoin generally they're not coming from legitimate environmentalists. They don't come from legitimate uh, critics, they actually are guerrilla marketing campaigns that are being financed and fueled by other crypto entrepreneurs because they have an interest in doing so. Engineering, harnessing energy and technique to make the world a better place than you found it. Right, from the point that we actually started to play with fire, right, that, that was a big leap forward. Uh, harnessing the power of, of kinetic energy and missiles, another, another step forward. Every city built on water, why water? Well, water's bringing energy, right? If you actually, if you actually put a turbine you know, on a river or, or you, uh, or you capture a change in elevation of water, you've literally harnessed gravitational energy. But, you know, water is also bringing you food. It's also giving you, you know, 
a cheap form of uh, getting rid of your waste. It's also giving you free transportation. You want to move one ton blocks around. You want to move them in water. So I think, I mean, the, the, the human story is really the story of engineering a better world. Um, and and uh, the rise in the human condition is determined by those uh, groups of people, those civilizations that were best at harnessing energy. Right? If you if you look, you know, the Greek civilization, they built it around around ports and seaports and and water and created a trading network. The Romans were really good at harnessing all sorts of of engineering. I mean, the aqueducts are a great example. If you go to any big city, you travel through cities in the Med, you find that, you know, the carrying capacity of, a, of the city or the island is 5,000 people without running water. And then if you can find a way to bring water to it, it increases by a factor of 10. And so human flourishing is really only possible through that channeling of energy. I guess you could say that, you know, the struggle of the human condition, it, it, it catalyzes the development of new technologies one after the other. It penalizes anybody that rejects ocean power, right, gets penalized. You reject artillery, you get penalized. You reject atomic power, you get penalized. If you reject digital power, cyber power, you get penalized. And, uh, and the, the underlying control of the property keeps shifting hands from, you know, one institution or one government to another based upon how rationally they're able to channel that energy. No, I, actually, I, you know, I think the provenance is really important. And if I were to look at the highlighted points. I, I think having a founder that was anonymous or pseudonymous is important. I think the founder disappearing is also important. I think that the fact that the Satoshi coins never moved is also important. I think the, the lack of an initial coin offering is also important. I think the lack of a corporate sponsor is important. I think the fact that it traded for 15 months with no commercial value was also important. You know, I, I think that um, the simplicity of the protocol is very important. I think that the, the outcome of the block size wars is very important. And all of those things add up to common property. They're, they're all indicia, indicators of a digital property as opposed to security. If there was a Satoshi sitting around, sitting on top of Fifty billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. It would. I don't think it would um, cripple Bitcoin as property, but I think it would undermine its digital property. And I, if I wanted to undermine a crypto asset network, I would do the opposite of all those things. I would launch one myself. I would sell 25% or 50% of the general public. I would keep some of the initial, I would pre-mine some stuff or early mine it, you know, and I would keep an influence on it. Those are all the opposite of what you would do in order to create common property. And so I, I see the entire story as Satoshi giving a gift of digital property to the human race and disappearing I mean, I, I think there's a there's a history of attempting to create something like this, and it was tried many, many times, and and they failed for different reasons. And I think that it's like Prometheus tried to start a fire 47 times, and maybe the 48th time it sparked. And th and that's how I see this. This is the first one that sparked, and uh, and it sets a roadmap for us. And I and I think. If you're looking for any one word to characterize, it's fair, right? The whole point of the network is it's a fair launch, a fair distribution. Like, yeah, I have Bitcoin, but I bought it. In fact, I, you know, at this point, we've paid $4 billion of you real cash to buy it. 
if, if I was sitting on the same position and I had it for free, then there's always this question of, did I, pay, you know, or I bought it for a nickel a coin or a penny a coin. The question is, was it fair? And, and that's a very hard question to answer, right? Did you acquire the Bitcoin that you own fairly? And if you roll the clock back, you know, you could have bought it for a nickel or a dime, but that was when it was a million times more likely to fail. Right? When the risk was greater, the cost was lower, and then over time, the risk became lower and the cost became greater. And the real critical thing was to allow the marketplace, absent any powerful interested actor, right? It's almost like if Satoshi had held a million coins and then stayed engaged for 10 more years, tweaking things in the background, there'd still be that question. But what we've got is really a beautiful thing. We've got a, we've got a chain reaction in cyberspace or an ideology spreading virally in the world that, um, that has seasoned in a fair ethical fashion. Sometimes it's a very violent, brutal fashion with all the volatility, right? And there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of sound and fury along the way. The thing that Satoshi taught us is you should do your part during some phase of the journey and then you should get out of the way. But uh, the most likely thing to happen next is um, large uh, acquisitions by institutional investors of Bitcoin as a digital gold where they're just swapping out gold for, for digital gold and thinking of it like that. And the government entities most likely to be involved with that would be sovereign wealth funds. If you look at all the sovereign wealth funds that are holding a big tech stock, uh, equities, the Swiss, the Norwegians, the Middle Easterners, uh, if you can hold big tech, then holding digital gold would be, you know, not, not far removed from that. That's a non-controversial adoption. I think there are, there are opportunities for governments that are much more profound, right? If a government started to adopt Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset, that's much bigger than just a, an asset investment. That's 100x bigger. And you could imagine that's like a trillion dollar opportunity. Like any government that wanted to adopt it as a treasury reserve asset would probably generate trillions of dollars, a trillion or more of, of value. And then, you know, the, the thing that people think about is, well, will oil ever be priced in Bitcoin or any other export commodity? I think there's like $1.8 trillion or more of export commodities in the world and right now they're all priced in dollars i i think that this is a colorful thing but it's not really that relevant like you could sell all that stuff in dollars that the, the relevant decision that any institution makes whether they're a non-profit a, a university a corporation or a government is what's your treasury reserve asset and if your treasury reserve asset is the peso and if the peso is losing 20 percent or 30 percent of its value a year then you know your your balance sheet is collapsing within five years and if the treasury reserve asset is uh is dollars and currency derivatives and u.s treasuries then you're getting your seven right now it's probably 15 percent or more uh, monetary inflation we're running double the historic average you could argue triple somewhere between double and triple depending upon what your metric is. The way I divide the world is, right, there's investment, there's saving, and there's speculation, and there's trading. So Bitcoin is an asset for saving. If, if you want to save money for 100 years, you don't really want to take on execution risk or the like. So you're just buying something to hold forever. For the, for you to actually endorse something as a property, like if you said to me, Mike, what should I 
buy for the next 100 years, I say, well, some amount of real estate, some amount of scarce collectibles, some amount of Bitcoin, right? You can run your company, right? But, but running your company is an investment. So the savings are properties. If you said, what should I invest in? I'd say, well, here's a list of good companies, private companies. You could start your own company. That's an investment, right? Um, if you said, what should I trade? Well, I'm trading as like a proprietary thing. Like I'm, I don't, I don't have any special insight into that. If you're a good trader, you know you are. If you said to me, what should you speculate in? Mm -hmm. We talk about meme stocks <laughs> and right. meme coins, and and it kind of sits up there. It sits right in the same space with what horse should you bet on, and what sports team should you gamble on, and should you bet on black six times in a row and double down each time. I mean, it's fun, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a speculation. What do you think the inflation rate's been for the past hundred years? If you, if you took a survey of everybody on the street and you asked them, what do they think inflation was? Or what is it? Yeah. You remember when Jerome Powell said our target's 2%, but we're not there? We've had 305x increase in price of the house. Now, if you actually back calculate, you can you come to a conclusion that the inflation rate was approximately six and a half percent a year, every year, for 92 years. Okay, and and there's nobody, nobody in government, no conventional economist that would ever admit to an inflation rate of seven percent a year in the U.S. dollar over the last century. I mean, money, money uh, I would say money is monetary energy or economic energy. And the economic energy has to find its way into a medium. So if you want to move it rapidly as a medium of exchange, it has to find its way into currency. But the money can also flow into property, like a house or gold. If the money flows into property, it'll probably hold its value much better. If the money flows into currency, Right? If you had put $100,000 in this house, you would have 305x return over 92 years. But if you had put the money, $100,000 in a safe deposit box and buried it in the basement, you would have lost 99.7% of your wealth over the same time period. So, um, so the, the expansion of the currency Creates, uh, creates a massive inefficiency in the society, what I'll call an adiabatic lapse. It's, what we're doing is we're bleeding the civilization to death. And by the way, I, you know, the conventional view of maximalists is they think there's only one and everything else isn't. That's not the point I'm gonna make. I would say we know there is, a, as a, there is at least one digital property, and that is Bitcoin. If you can create a truly decentralized, non-custodial, you know, bearer instrument that is not under the control of any organization that is fairly distributed, you know, then you might create another or multiple, and there may be others out there. But I think that uh, the frustration of a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, and, and I share this with Jack, is we could create a hundred trillion dollars of value in the real world simply by building applications on top of Bitcoin as a foundation. And so continually trying to reinvent the wheel and, uh, and create uh, competitive things is a massive waste of time and it's diversion of human uh, human creativity it's like we, we have an ethical good thing yeah. and now we're going to try to create a third or a fourth one why And I, I Googled something the other day, you know, what's the most common form of mammal life 
on the earth? The answer that came back was human beings. Apparently, if we're just looking at mammals, the answer was human beings are the most common, which was very interesting to me. Remember George Washington, you know how he died? Well-meaning physicians bled him to death. And this was the most important patient in the country, maybe in the history of the country. And, it's, and we bled him to death, trying to help him. So when you're actually inflating the money supply at 7%, but you're calling it 2% because you want to help the economy, you're literally bleeding the, uh, the free market to death. But the sad fact is George Washington went along with it because he thought that they were going to do him good. And the majority of, of uh, the society, most companies, most, most conventional thinkers, you know, the working class, they go along with this because they think that uh, someone has their best interest in mind. And the people that are bleeding them to death believe they, they believe that prescription because their mental models are just so defective. If, if there was any development team that's continually changing it, you know, on a routine basis, it becomes harder and harder uh, to maintain its decentralization because now, now there's the issue of who's influencing that changes. Yeah. So what you really want is um, is a very very simple idea, right? The simplest idea. I'm just going to keep track of who owns 21 million parts of energy. And when someone proposes big functional upgrades, you, you almost don't you don't really want that development to go on the base layer. You want that development to go on the layer threes because now. Cash App has a proprietary set of functionality and it's a security. And if you're gonna promote the use of this thing, you're not gonna you're not gonna promote the layer three security because that's a an, an edge to a given entity and you're trusting the counterparty, you're gonna promote the layer one or at most the layer two. Decade one was entrepreneurial, experimental. Decade two is a rotation from entrepreneurs to institutions and it's becoming institutionalized. So maybe decade one, you go from zero to a trillion and decade two, you go from one trillion to a hundred trillion. Yeah, I mean, I got a thousand opinions we could talk about and I could pursue a thousand things, but I don't expect to be successful. And I'm not sure that my opinion in any of the 999 is any more valid than the leader of thought in that area. So how about if I just focus upon one thing and then, uh, and then uh, deliver the best I can in the one thing? That's, that's the laser eye message. The first wave of digital transformation was the dematerialization of all of these informational things which are non-conservative. That is, you know, I could take Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, played for by the best orchestra in Germany, and I could give it to a billion people and they could play it a thousand times each at less than the cost of the one performance, right? So. So I deliver culture and education and erudition and, and intelligence and insight to the entire civilization over digital rails. And the consequences of the human race are first order, generally good, right? The world is a better place, it drives growth. And you create these trillion dollar entities like Apple and Amazon and Facebook and Google and Microsoft, right? That is the first wave.
You know, you got to admire, you know, the, the first person that built a bridge crossing a chasm, or the first person to work out the problem of how to get running water to a village, or the, the first person to figure out how to, you know, dam up a river, or mastered agriculture, or, or the guy that figured out, you know, how to grow fruit on trees or created orchards, you know, and maybe one day he had like 10 fruit trees. He's pretty proud of himself. It seems clear to me that the world wants more specialists. It wants, it wants you to be an expert in, and to focus on in one area. And it, it's punishing uh, generalist uh, jack of all trades, especially people that are generalists in the physical realm. Because if you're a specialist in the digital realm, you might very well, you're the person with 700,000 followers on Twitter and you show them how to tie knots, or you know, you're the banjo player, you know, with 1.8 million followers, and when everybody types banjo, it's you, right? Yeah. And so, the world wants people that that do something well, and then it wants to stamp out 18 million copies of them. Instead of 500,000 algebra teachers going through the same motion over and over again, what you need is, is like one or five or 10 really good algebra teachers and they need to do it a billion times a day or a billion times a year for free. And if we do that, there's no reason why you can't give infinite education, certainly in, uh, in science, technology, engineering and math, right? infinite education to everybody with no constraint. The problem with the physical hotel is I got to hire real people moving subject to the speed of sound and physics laws and Newton's laws and I can rent it to people in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. But if it was a digital hotel, I could rent the room to people in Paris, London, and New York every night, and I can run it with robots. And as soon as I do that, I can rent it by the room hour, and I can rent it by the room minute. And so I start to chop my hotel up into 100,000 room hours that I sell to the highest bidder anywhere in the world. And you can see all of a sudden the yield the rent and the income of the property is dramatically in increased. I can also see the maintenance cost of the property falls. I get on Moore's law and I'm operating in cyberspace. So I got rid of Newton's laws. I got rid of all the friction and all, the, all those okay. problems. I, I tapped into the benefits of cyberspace. I created a global property. I started monetizing at different frequencies. And of course, now I can mortgage it to anybody in the world, right? I mean, you're not going to be able to get a mortgage on a Turkish building from someone, you know, in South Africa. You have to have to find someone that's local to the culture you're in. So when you start to move from analog property to digital property, it's not just a little bit better. It's a lot better. And what I just described, Lex, is like the DeFi vision, right? It's, it's the beauty of DeFi flash loans, money moving at high velocity. At some point, if, if the hotel is dematerialized, then what's the difference between renting a hotel room and loaning a block of stock, right? I'm just finding the highest best use of the thing. There's a dynamic there, which is profound because it's global. But now let's go to the next extreme. I'm still giving you a fairly conventional idea, which is let's just loan the money fast on a global network and let's just rent the hotel room fast in cyberspace. 
But now, let's move to maybe a, a more innovative idea. The first generation of the internet, you know, brought a lot of productivity, but there's also just a lot of flaws in it. For example, Twitter is full of garbage. Instagram DMs are full of garbage. Your Twitter DMs are full of garbage. YouTube is full of scams. Every 15 minutes, there's a Michael Saylor Bitcoin giveaway spun up on YouTube. Yep. My Office 365 inbox is full of garbage. Millions of spam messages. I'm running four different email filters. My company spends million dollars a year to fight denial of service attacks and all sorts of other security things. There are denial of service attacks everywhere against everybody in cyberspace all the time. It's extreme. And we're all beset with hostility, right? You, you've been a victim of it on Twitter. I'm, you know, you go on Twitter and, and people post stuff they would never say to your face. And then if you look, you find out that the account was created like three days ago and it's not even a real person. So, you know, we're beset with phishing attacks and scams and spam bots and garbage. And why? And the answer is because the first generation of internet was digital information and there's no energy. There's no conservation of energy in cyberspace. The thing that makes the universe work is conservation of energy. Like if I went to a hotel room, I'd have to post a credit card. And then if I smashed the place up, there'd be economic consequences. Maybe there'd be criminal consequences. There might be reputational consequences. You know, a lamp might fall on me. But in the worst case, I can only smash up one hotel room. Now imagine I could actually write a Python script to send myself to every hotel room in the world every minute, not post a credit card, and smash them all up anonymously. Right? The, the thing that makes the universe work is friction, speed of sound, speed of light, and the fact that that it's ultimately it's conservative. You're either energy or you're matter, but once you've used the energy, it's gone and you can't do infinite everything. That's missing in cyberspace right now. And if you look at the, look at all of the moral hazards and all of the product defects that we have in all of these products, most of them, 99% of them could be cured if we introduced conservation of energy into cyberspace and that's what you can do with high-speed digital property high-speed bitcoin and and by high speed i mean not 20 transactions a day i mean 20,000 transactions a day What's the most rational strategy if you're a competitor? Take your entire balance sheet and invest it in Bitcoin and then borrow against your balance sheet to fund your operations. There's every single month for the past 13 months, there have been fundamental developments in the space that have made it a better idea. Every single month, every week, I almost see a new development that makes, that makes the network stronger, smarter, faster, harder. It makes it more anti-fragile. It makes it more light. It, it becomes clearer and clearer that this is the future of digital property, this is digital energy, this is the future of digital money, this is the solution to the, the problems of the world, this is a macroeconomic imperative for $500 trillion worth of capital, this is a technical imperative for everybody in the technology industry and the energy industry, and this is a moral imperative for everybody on earth, right? So. I've just become more convicted every single week, every single month that's gone by. There's not a single thing that's happened the past 13 months that I thought caused me to think that the future was riskier or less certain.
speed of sound, speed of light. Now, it will replace gold, which is $10 trillion asset. Bitcoin's like a 1.2. It'll go by a factor of 10. And in, in three to five years, it'll certainly replace gold. Then it will replace indexes, right? The S&P index or bond indexes. It'll start to demonetize uh, fixed income and equity indexes that are used as a store of value. but that doesn't create more stuff, right? You're just creating paper. So ultimately, that, in, that inflation, it works only to an extent if you can export it. And what you're doing is you're not, you're not creating anything. What you're doing is you're redistributing wealth. Like if there's $10 billion in the economy and there's this much stuff and I give a billion dollars to you, you now get 10% of the stuff from somebody else, which means that everybody else lost 10% of their stuff, right? As I inflate the economy, I'm actually, or inflate the currency, I'm actually redistributing wealth from those that uh, store their life savings in currency or currency derivatives, in cash. If you have, if you had a million dollars in the bank 12 months ago, today it buys you 34% less, right? The S&P is up 34%. You have a million dollars. If you put it in the stock market, you've got $1.34 million. If you hold it in cash, you've got a million dollars. If you go to buy a stock now, it costs you 34% more to buy the stock. If you go to buy a house in the Hamptons, it's 40% more to buy the house in the Hamptons. A shockwave forms when you move faster than the, uh, than the air. If I move through the air faster than, than uh, the air can, um, can flow around me, then I create a shockwave. Uh, I'm disrupting laminar flow and I'm getting turbulence because I'm going too fast, okay? Bitcoin is creating turbulence because it's going too fast. And if I'm a genius and I execute well, maybe I can stay ahead of everybody else. Maybe, maybe. But while I'm doing that, every single free dollar I can raise, I should convert to Bitcoin. Because there's many, out of a hundred possibilities, there's 99 paths where you fail and Bitcoin succeeds. And there's one path where you fail, where you succeed and Bitcoin succeeds. And, you know, some people don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, but they're not, they're not with us, right? You don't think Bitcoin is going to succeed, go do something else, you know, whatever with your life, but don't, don't try to create a Bitcoin business. Bitcoin is the first engineered monetary system in the history of the human race. Full stop. Bitcoin is property rights, properly understood. And that is an important economic empowerment. It's a protection of individual liberties. It's John Locke's dream, life, liberty, and property. Bitcoin is, is gradually demonetizing these other assets. And the idea is to return rationality 
to, to make things more rational, right? If people start buying Bitcoin instead of buying a second investment property, the price of property will go down for people that want a first home. Satoshi's innovation is real, which is another way to say we have created truly decentralized digital property in cyberspace that is not owned and controlled by any company, any individual or any government. We have common property para to gold or land or commodities. Money is energy and energy is life. And if I keep sucking the energy out of the economy, I'm sucking the oxygen out of your system. Either under the best case, you perform poorly. Under the worst case, I suffocate you to death or freeze you to death. That's the problem. That's why, it, that's why empires collapse. That's why economies collapse. And the problem, it's not just a problem for an individual. It's not just a problem for a family. It's a problem for every institution, it's a problem for every company, it's a problem for every city, every municipality, every government, every civilization. They all have this problem, and you can generally trace the problem to, I, I fought a war I couldn't afford to fight, and I paid for it with money I didn't have. Bitcoin. <laughs> the most important thing Satoshi did was he created this gift, he gave it to the world, I assume a he, some people think she, some people think it's multiple people, but Satoshi gave this gift to the world and disappeared. the value of your salary is de deteriorating by 20% a year. It's not falling at the rate of CPI inflation, it's falling at the rate of monetary inflation. The road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. Okay. That's the problem. You're a dentist, you're, you're, you're generating 5% more a year for a decade, I'm inflating the money supply at 20% a year for a decade, if you save every penny in 10 years, you'll be able to buy one quarter of what you could have bought today because the price of housing is going up at 20% right. a year and you're just not ever gonna catch up, right? Because you're, uh, you're getting paid in the currency. The average American, the average, the average wage earner is forced to take their life savings and gamble it in the stock market in order to avoid losing their life savings. My 83-year-old father has to guess which stock is going to go up this week. If I want to be a consumer and live in my parents' basement and order Domino's pizza and take Ubers and watch Netflix and stream YouTube, the inflation rate will be the CPI. It'll be very low.
Because it's the hardest to tax, and it's the hardest to steal, and it's the hardest to, to confiscate, it's, and, you know, it makes it the last thing in the world you're going to attack, the path of least resistance. Right? When, it, when it's time for me to tax, uh, tax property in California, I'm going to put a tax on the building. Buildings don't move. If I put a 2% tax on the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin's moving to Wyoming. If I put a put a 2% tax on Wyoming, it's moving to whatever state in the union they didn't tax it. And when the entire country taxes it, it's moving to Monaco. And if everybody, you know, in Monaco taxes it, I can sell it to someone in China, right? It's universally desirable, scarce property, hard to steal. You can you can sell it, you can put a lien on it, you can mortgage it, you can develop it, you can protect it. Inflation is a phenomenon whereby uh, a government authority prints more currency, right? And why do they print more currency? Because if I want to pay a trillion dollar bill, I either have to tax you a trillion dollars or I have to print a trillion dollars of money. Turns out that it's a lot easier to print money than it is to tax people. And so it's either inflation or taxation. Throughout the history of the world, from Roman emperors before, you know, Every single coinage system, every monetary system ever established collapsed because of inflation. It's not spoils of war, it's spoils of peace. This is another big idea I want to make. With everything else, if we monetize, if we have a bunch of money, if I give you a million dollars and I tell you to go buy stuff with it and you buy gold jewelry and a house and a car and a whatever and I want it, I put a gun to your head, give me your stuff, Tucker, and you say no, I shoot you and take your stuff. There's nothing in this world that you can own that I can't take with force except Bitcoin. Okay? If you take the million dollars and you buy Bitcoin, and you take personal custody of it and you own the keys, the keys password is in your head. I hold the gun to your head, give me your Bitcoin, you can say no. Now, I can still shoot you in the head, but I don't get the property. You see, you can take it. This is the only property in the history of mankind, Tucker, you can take to the grave. The pharaohs wanted to take their gold with them to the grave. They created these pyramids to bury themselves with gold, but grave diggers and grave robbers steal the gold. You can't take anything else with you, but you can take the password in your head. Why is that significant? Well, you study the history of the Jews in the 30s in Nazi Germany, and, and most of them left with, if they were lucky, 10% of their assets. They would have left with all their assets if their assets were in Bitcoin. They couldn't move their house. They can't move a building. You can't haul the gold. Maybe you try to smuggle diamonds. Not very good store of value. It's the history of every diaspora, every people. When you leave, you know, when the Jews got driven out of Spain in whatever, 14, 1500, you know, during the Inquisition, it was all over property, right? They're stealing their property. If you look at all these wars, right, how long does a war go on? It go, in World War I, every single nation went off the gold standard within a week of the declaration of World War I. The Germans, the French, the, the Brits, the Americans, we printed money. Uh, the money got debased. There was rampant inflation. Eventually, after four years, you can print money for about four years before you collapse the currency and then you don't have any means to fight the war. The Germans sued for peace because they ran out of money after four years. Okay. World War II, we ran out of money in four years. Vietnam, you know, we paid for it with inflation. Eventually, um, eventually Nixon had to go off the gold standard because they printed so much money, they couldn't redeem the gold. They defaulted on it. We went to the fiat standard and uh, we just began to print more money. You'll find that throughout history. And of course, put yourself into the position of the Roman emperor 
or uh, the city mayor or the noble, you, you have a monopoly on the coinage. You need to pay the army. You can either go to everybody that, that uh, lives in your nation and take half their stuff, or you can just print twice as many coins. And the beauty is, look, we need Square to do what they're doing. Why? Because you need a big company to actually compete with Apple. Apple Computer is not going to enter the Bitcoin space because they're threatened by a non-custodial wallet, you know, coming out of South America, right? They're not going to compete. They're not going to enter the space for Chivo either. But they will enter the space if they see Square and PayPal generating hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. If you think that Square is going to take 500 million users off of Apple Pay, that will cause a response from a Facebook or a Google or an Apple. I think that the entire universe is made of energy. Like if you, the earth is energy, a building is energy, matter is energy. And I think that energy is a more powerful idea than matter. If matter is energy and energy is matter, then energy is the highest, you know, cleanest, purest, most useful form. You know, we talk about money. Money is, money is capital as energy. Or, you know, as I can look at all the capital stock in the society and say all the buildings, all the companies, all the products, all the commodities, that's one view of the capital stock. And the other view of the capital stock is all the money and they should balance sort of in some way. And I could look at the world as saying, it's all the matter in the, in the world. And then I could uh, snap my fingers and I can turn it into energy, right? And then I could turn it back into matter. And that's what Einstein told us. So I, th I think that once you understand it as digital energy, then you realize that it's a lot more than a store of value. If I, if I wrap myself in, like right now, if I wrap myself in digital energy, I could move through cyberspace with, uh, with greater substance and, uh, and credit worthiness. Like, I think that the solution, for example, to cybersecurity is, is everybody has to post a certain amount of Satoshis as their credit as their credit deposit or their security deposit. And then whenever you hit a website or DM someone or show up to a meeting or, uh, or you post an offer or you make a comment, then you have that security deposit. And then if you break the rules, like you lie or try to cheat someone, then so you would get fined by that platform, like a speed speeding ticket or the like. And in that world, uh, in that world, that Bitcoin on a lightning rail becomes digital energy, which provides cybersecurity at the speed of light. And, and it's a very big idea, a lot bigger idea than I'm just going to store money in digital property instead of in a house. When I go, um, all my assets will flow into a foundation and the foundation's mission is to make education free for everybody forever. And uh, if, uh, if I'm able to contribute to the creation of, of uh, a more perfect monetary system, then maybe that foundation will go on forever.